Today's episode, we got Stormy Bonnie and Tony, VSIN, game, sports gambling host, and ESPN sideline reporter along with the XFL. Stormy, appreciate you coming on. Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me in. Excellent pronunciation of my last name. I got to say, it's hard. It's hard. <laughs> I appreciate that uh, you taking it easy on me because it it definitely took some some getting used to. Um, but so I'm gonna go ahead and just hop in because I know you got uh, your your uh, press for time. So obviously you starting off doing the XFL on ESPN and obviously the VSEN Sports Gambling Network. Talk to me about how those are you're able to bridge those two together for what everything that's now become within mainstream within our sports industry. Yeah, it's. It's super cool, especially as a girl who grew up in Las Vegas and sports betting and gambling has just been a super normal part of my entire life. Yeah. But then when I moved other places and had real jobs where I worked for like the Mountain West Conference, for example, or the Carolina Panthers, betting is super frowned upon and it's not mm-hmm. something that's talked about in an okay light. So to be a part of a national football broadcast for a professional sports league where we have spreads on the score bug down at the bottom of your broadcast. Uh And I am openly encouraged to talk about the total and live lines for our game is monumental. And it is so cool to see how the space and how broadcasting is changing. And I feel so honored to be a small part of it with, with a league and with a network in ESPN who encourages it so much. Like I absolutely love what I do at VEASAN. My uncle, Eugene Bonantoni is actually an odds maker. That's what he does. My grandfather, who's no longer with us, sadly, he used to run local sports books in Del Mar and Santa Anita and the Rose Bowl. So it's been something that's always been a part of my life Mm -hmm. that is just super wild that I get to do that on national TV (laughs) now. I never in a million years would have thought that. Yeah, you know, exactly what you just said. I never thought there would come a day where that's now mainstream, where it's not widely frowned upon, where now, like you just said, you're seeing the spreadsheets and things like that at the stadium on your TV screen and how now it's just widely accepted. But at the end of the day, we all know that it's all about the almighty dollar and any way that they can make money. That's something that they're going to do. So that's something I've been pleasantly surprised with, but especially how you haven't seen yet any sort of any sort of discrepancies, any sort of like, you know, somebody uh, other than my man for the Atlanta Falcons, where they're perceived as being as betting on their own games or right. uh, sh- point shaving, you know, throwing games, things like that. So I'm pleasantly surprised that I have not seen an abundance of that yet, because that was something that I was always very nervous about happening. Yeah. And I mean, at the end of the like, day, gambling has always been around. It was yeah. just illegal before. Mm-hmm. And now with legalization, like spreading across the country where it's not just here in Nevada, it's legalized in 36 yeah. states and just continuing to grow year after year. And the fact that leagues have relationships with sports books, like that things are sponsored by DraftKings or sponsored by Caesar Sportsbooks, yeah. Sportsbook and a lot of those sportsbook entities, if not all of them, have things in place to recognize like professional athletes and get their names. Like that's why that happened to Calvin Ridley, right? Because his name and information couldn't be in the system because the NFL has those protections in place so that that type of thing doesn't happen, which is extremely smart on their part to make sure that there aren't issues. Although... (laughs) Ridley situation still makes me laugh a little bit. I'm like, it come does. on, it was a however many leg parlay and you had the Falcons in it. Let's be real. But um, but no, it's it is, it's really cool thing to see how much it's grown. And I mean, I live in a place here in Las Vegas where I was told my entire life that sports couldn't work here, period, because of the type of town it is and because of sports betting and because it's Sin City. And now we have just major professional sports leagues piled on top of each other. It seems like that. The NFL draft was here. The Super Bowl is going to be here in a year. It's just normalized. And um, I think it's exciting. I think it's the wave of the future. Yes. And that's something that I've been really interested in asking you as being a VSIN host. Looking forward as far as how now 
sports betting is now legal. Do you feel that there's any sort of parameters? You feel like there's any sort of uh, any any more of a structure that needs to be implemented, whether it is college, whether it is professional in any sport to make sure that you don't have any more issues like you just mentioned with Calvin Ridley or anything like that going forward. So the thing with Calvin Ridley's situation, and I hate that we keep going back and piling on him and his situation, but like the NFL, you know, has so many things that you have to yeah. sign legally that says, yep. I'm not going to do this. And I think they're doing a good job of protecting themselves. The issues have been very few and far between that something has arose. Like I used to be a, a team reporter for the Carolina Panthers and I had to sign those same documents that mm -hmm. said I wouldn't gamble on anything NFL related. When I worked for the Mountain West Conference, I couldn't gamble on anything because it was an NCAA institution. Yeah. I couldn't bet on anything that even had an NCAA championship as a professional sport. So like no professional football, no professional basketball, anything if it had an NCAA championship. So I think that there are a lot of those safeguards in place. It's just a matter of continuing to monitor it now that it's so openly talked about. Like even myself, there's nothing in my contract for example at least as far as i know unless i'm not reading it correctly it says <laughs> specifically like i can't bet on anything but as a professional and as somebody that has like integrity for the game and what i do i would never bet on one of my games mm -hmm. and i think that's something as broadcasters that's important too for us to like we have the privilege that we have to be in certain meetings and learn about injuries and learn about starters before other people to uphold that trust is a very important thing. No doubt about it. You know, I think that uh, like what you just said, the integrity, that's something that has to be upheld. I think for all of this to work to, for all of it to be simpatico with the mm -hmm. sports gambling and, you know, whatever league uh, it may be that people are, are taking that high, that high interest in. So changing gears, to you now being the sideline reporter for the XFL. Obviously, it's back. Everybody's, you know, really, really energized about it. One of my former coaches, Rod Woodson, he's the head yeah. coach of, of the Las Vegas team. And talk to me what it's been like so far. And then also how it looks seeing that new kickoff format of close and personal. <laughs> It's a little bit weird seeing everybody stand <laughs> still, right? You have to wait yeah. until the ball is either caught or has gone out of bounds or has been out of play for three seconds. It's like the weirdest, but awesome because it encourages more returns. Like there mm -hmm. haven't been any touchbacks. There's always been a return. And that's part of what the rule is doing is not only promoting returns, but promoting player safety. So it's not just these crazy, crazy head on collisions as much. We know how concussions have been so important, yeah. but What's really cool, I think, about the XFL and why I think slash hope that it works and survives this time, whereas it hasn't in previous iterations, is that it's not trying to compete with the NFL. Like it knows what it is. It knows that it's spring football and is trying to be as much as possible a developmental league to the NFL. Mm -hmm. And that's not only for players who are looking for a second chance or looking for that opportunity to take the next step in their career, but also for other things around the broadcast when it comes to um, officials and officiating, we can hear everything that yes, they have to I say love that part. Go through a call. Isn't that crazy? Oh yeah. I love that. Yeah. Cause like, <laughs> think about how many times we're sitting there and we're like, Oh, what's taking so long. These refs suck. <laughs> da, 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 da. I can't figure it out. But we get to hear every stage of their process to get to the ruling and and why it's called one way versus another. Because if something was called a certain way on the field and there's just not enough to overturn it, they have to look at all these different angles and explain yes. why. So I think that's super valuable. Um, it's crazy for my job to... As soon as a play happens, I'm going up to that guy and asking mm -hmm. what happened? How did that work? Um, and the coaches, you mentioned Rod Woodson, a 17 year NFL vet, however yeah. many zillion pro bowls the guys had mm -hmm. Mind Ward, a head coach. You've got Bob Stoops, Wade Phillips, Anthony Beck, like some of these names are so cool and yes. I think are helping to get eyeballs. And it's helped that these first couple of weeks, we've had really exciting games too. Oh, no doubt about it. They've been very exciting so far. And I think that 
it shows that it's here to stay. It shows that it's going to be able to compete. And that brings me to my next question. We all know, as you just mentioned, it's not trying to compete with the NFL. It's more of a developmental league. Obviously, it happens in the offseason, but... We have another league that is going to be coming up for their season soon with the USFL. Give me your thoughts on what the XFL needs to do or what it's already done. And can it go ahead and match wits with the USFL to being that premier offseason league uh, per se? Yeah, I hope it does. I think ownership helps too with the XFL that you have people like Dwayne Johnson and Danny Garcia who are a little bit higher profile people yeah. that are trying to get the league out there. And Dwayne Johnson, obviously his story, he's, he's an actor and does all uh-huh. these things now, but his story of being a former football player and being, he couldn't make the 53 man roster. Yeah. He was always considered player 54. And he was always told he needed that one extra step. I think that the XFL has done a really good job of promoting itself and of cultivating a relationship with the NFL to the point that they're looking at a lot of things that this league is doing to see if there are rules that they might want to implement in the future, whether it's the, the one, one time, anytime, any call challenge that the XFL has analyzing that or how many players in the NFL do you think would like the opportunity to go for a fourth and 15 in the fourth quarter instead yes. of an onside kick to maintain possession? Uh, I'd love seeing that. Oh, so like little things that I think that the XFL has that are unique to see if maybe the NFL would like to take that on. And, and the personalities, I think, too, are just are are very different. The way that, at least in my experience, compared to what I saw from the USFL previously, they've done a really good job of promoting the big names. Like even on the field, Josh Gordon, Martavis Bryant, yeah. mm-hmm. um, people that like A.J. McCarron, who's led two straight weeks of game winning drives in the last 90 seconds of a game. So things like that are a little bit different. You know, going back to that whole kickoff, new kickoff format, and obviously with we see how the the wedge formation within the kickoff return that was outlawed uh, several years ago because you don't want to have that. You want to have the player safety. You don't want to have that that car crash that literally happens from being 60 yards apart and players colliding. Do you feel that the injury that happened to DeMar Hamlin back on January 3rd, uh, about a month and a half, I'm sorry, almost two months ago, do you feel that that may have had any impact on the XFL having this new kickoff format? So I don't think so simply because I know that it was already in place and it was something that they were wanting to do because just in general, different opportunities and ways to create and cultivate player safety are top of mind. I mean, we saw what happened with DeMar Hamlin, which was so scary, but also just Tua Tonga Bailoa taking mm-hmm. hard hits the way that he has taken them. How many times have we seen these scary moments on the football field where, yes, it's a physical and it's an aggressive game and it's modern day gladiators in a lot of yeah. ways. And I know y'all want to show your toughness, <laughs> but at the same oh, we time, got we've heard too many stories of guys 10 years and beyond removed from their careers dealing with CTA as uh, uh, CTE dealing with with problems of just not being able to move their bodies the way that they used to be able to and it's scary and i know that a lot of you guys know that you're putting your body on the line but to the extent down the line nobody really knows until it happens to them and so this is just a way i think that the xfl can try to find ways to safe to to have more safety for players that that maybe the nfl tries it out maybe they don't but they're always looking for different ways to make the game still still aggressive but safer for everybody for their futures you know i like how you bought up the Tua Tagovailoa situation, and he's just the tip of the iceberg. He's just a euphemism right now for what I'm about to go ahead and go into. And for a lot of players, myself being a former player and other guys that I played with, even guys that I know that are still playing right now, like I had Quandary Diggs uh, on just a couple days ago. And the thing is, is that for a good number of us, we already know the risk going in. We may not know to the extent like what you just mentioned. And 
for a lot of us, the reward outweighs the risk. And that justifies, I'm sorry, the uh, the ends justifies the means. And because of that, for a lot of people that, you know what, they may not be able to just go and find a high paying job straight out of college where they're making seven or eight figures if they're lucky or something like that. So because of that, they're willing to take those risks. Now, right, wrong, or indifferent, that's how players feel. I'm interested in for you being a sideline reporter, for you seeing it from the opposite side, the opposite end, I'm interested in your take on that philosophy. Yeah, and like I I get it, and that's why I think that as many precautions as the league can take to almost like save the athlete from himself in some instances is important. Um, and I've known, like you said, in my role as a sideline reporter, I've seen some really scary injuries. I remember two years ago, I was doing a BYU game right here at Allegiant Stadium to kick off the season in 2021-22. And a player got hit so hard and hit that his his limbs weren't moving. He couldn't move his fingers or toes or anything. And they had to take him immediately on a stretcher to the nearest hospital. And fortunately, he ended up being all right. But you don't know, again, what the repercussions from that moment are going to be down the line in the moment. Mm -hmm. And like at that time, like I couldn't imagine what his parents were thinking, what his teammates were thinking as I'm just walking the sideline, like everybody's mood and mentality is so different from having fun and hitting people to it's not so fun anymore. And so it, I think I know that people want to see hard hits and people talk about how the NFL is just getting softer compared to the olden days. But it's also like making sure that these guys have a life beyond football, because for as wonderful of the things as football can do for so many people. And you talk about the ends justifying the means, like people helping get their family out of tough situations, coming from a, a tough neighborhood or having a, a family member with an illness and being able to have the money to support them and help them, like all these amazing things still want to protect yourself if you can. And I, I appreciate at least that the league is trying to do their best to do that. Yeah. You know, I think that uh, whenever you see situations like the ones that have come up, at least the ones that we've now been hearing about, the ones that are becoming publicized with the brain disease, with the CTE, with players dying earlier than their life expectancy. That's something that, especially when that movie came out with Will Smith, I forget what it was called, but I'm pretty sure you know what I was talk what I'm talking about. Just that right there, just it, it, it took and it shined a bright light on the safety aspect on yeah, the health well, like, going forward, we, especially for uh, for former players. We go talked ahead. about Tua. Like, are you not nervous to see him yeah. go out there and play on the football field now whenever he goes out? Like, I have a little bit of a different feeling when I watch him play football ever since he took that scary hit. Mm -hmm. It's like one more concussion. What's going to happen to this guy? So I don't know. It's, it's a difficult thing to talk about, but yes. I think it's an important one. Oh, no doubt about it. And I think that it really boils down to like what you just said, it's it's very difficult and tough to talk about because everybody has their own perspective and everybody's perspective comes from their own intricate, specific situation. You know, like I've played with certain guys that they come from affluent families. So for them, playing football was just more so like a hobby. And then I played with certain guys that they're like, hey, Stan, like this is my only way to improve my family's life and my future going forward. So I think that for so many different people, and that's a beautiful thing about sports because it brings everybody from all different walks of life, whether it's religion, whether it is the state you're from, the country you're from and things like that, all to just one place. And you got one, you got one singular focus and that's to be successful. That's to win a championship. That's to win games, things like that. And so that's where to me, it gets fascinating because everybody's opinion, everybody's take on it will be different because of their own specific environment, their own specific scenario as to why they're doing this. Yeah, no doubt. And again, that's just what takes me back to that point about the NFL, like protecting the athlete from himself as much as possible because it is such a violent sport. So like we all want it to be fun, right? <laughs> yep. we, we love the game for a reason. 
it's exciting. And when you hear a hard hit, how many times like your eyes light up and you're like, Oh my goodness. But you want the guy to pop back up. You don't want the Mm -hmm. guy to stay down. So. Okay. Stormy speaking of sin city. Obviously, yeah. you're from there. The team that I played with the the most the majority of my years in the NFL now resides there. And next year, there's going to be a Super Bowl out yes. there. Talk to me about how that feels. Number one, your hometown now having an NFL franchise. And yes. number two, your hometown now hosting a Super Bowl coming up very soon. So I got to tell you. Right, right off the top. I'm a 49ers fan. Okay. So it is. <laughs> hey, I get Hey, Listen, I, w- I can say this now because I'm no longer playing. But listen, I was a 49ers fan growing up as well. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> well, that must have been so tough for you. The Battle of the Bay. It was. It really, really was. I mean, after I left, after I got done with high school, I stopped being a fan of teams and I was just a fan of players by the time I got to college. But, uh, but yes, growing up. I was a 49ers fan through and through. Steve Young, Ricky Waters, Deion Sanders, Jerry Rice, Stubblefield, Merton Hanks. I could go all the way down the list. Jerry Rice is like my favorite player of all time <laughs> in any sport. So, oh, yes. yes, we are simpatico. Um, but so when the team first got announced that they were going to come here, I it was two feelings. It was, heck, yes, mm-hmm. we are going to have – a franchise here in the National Football League. That is unbelievable. And then, man, it's got to be the Raiders. Now I have to root for these fools. (laughs) (laughs) That black and silver. (laughs) But no, it it truly is. It is so incredible. And I, I mentioned it a little bit earlier when I was just talking about it being my hometown, that we went from my entire life, like I thought that I could never work here to do what I want to do in sports because essentially there was minor league baseball and UNLV Mm -hmm. and I had higher aspirations than that. No, no shade or slight to UNLV. There were just other things that I wanted to do. And to now have moved back to this city because I got a job with the Vegas Golden Knights who were the first professional franchise in any sport to be here in the city the attachment that the city had to the Golden Knights and still has after that miracle run they had their first season of existence going to Stanley Cup against the Capitals. And to see the way that proved to people what we could do here and that this was a city that was so starving for sports and we love sports betting. Why the heck wouldn't we love sports, right? Mm -hmm. So it has worked out so well that we have the Golden Knights, we have the Raiders, we have a WNBA team here in the Aces, and then things just keep on adding potentially Major League Baseball, potentially the NBA at some point. We have an XFL franchise. We have a professional lacrosse team. We have a arena football we like oh wow i didn't even know that going i know it's absurd but in the best possible way that this went from a place that i tried to get away from to work in sports (laughs) that now everybody wants to come to to work in sports and for the super bowl to be here and to have all of the nfl world invading vegas for that is going to be just unreal i'm so excited i'm already trying to figure out do i need to rent out my house like (laughs) But I'm really, really excited. Now, I got a question for you. As a Raider fan, obviously, you being across the bay as far as where your fandom came from, you might feel differently. And I'm going to make a statement, and then you tell me where this lands with you. Because Vegas is a city that a lot of people visit, obviously, and a lot of people don't realize this, but Vegas has a a, a very nice population as far as people that live there. Most people just don't uh, do their homework or pay attention. But because Vegas always has a lot of tourism, a lot of tourists, that it's difficult to really build that stern, that foundational type of fan base that you know is going to be there through thick and thin, through and through. And because of that, that's why you'll never see the sold out over and over and repeated things like that. You tell me where that lands with you as far as me making that statement. Well, so for the Golden Knights, we have that. And oh, so, so it's just my Raiders. In. Yeah. So, but I think that's kind of the what happens when you're a transplant team, mm-hmm. right? Because True. you're somebody else's fan base, you're not our fan base yet. And whereas the Golden Knights, like their motto, their slogan is Vegas born. And, 
you know, like I said, the first professional franchise here with that first season sold out every single game, even when they were bad last year, the seats are filled. It's basically like a, like a Cirque du Soleil show on ice for their intermissions. They do a really good job of, of branding it. I think the Raiders are a team that has, but it's also granted NHL arenas seat way fewer people than an NFL stadium. But for, as far as the NFL goes, you, you guys are Oakland's team. We're still growing up. We're still trying true, to figure you out. True. You know, we're still, <laughs> we're still mm-hmm. working on it. But I think that there's a lot of, I mean, the stadium is beautiful. They need yeah. to work out parking. I think that would get more. Yeah. Butts they can figure out the parking situation, <laughs> but I don't think that the tourism factor, like, I don't think that, that being a transplant city um, in terms of like people visiting and being in and out of the city is a, is a hindrance. I think this is a place people want to come to be honest with you. So if you're um, if you're a fan of another team and you want to come to a, a game that's on their schedule, that's a, an away game, you probably want to go to Vegas. Right. Yeah. So I don't see it as a bad thing. Okay. All right. You mentioned you that build it up. you just got to build it up. Exactly. Like we're trying to, but you see everything that happens with Winning coach health. being gone, got to bench the quarterback. He's not even going to be allowed in the facility for the past, for the last two games of the season. And I mean, listen. Winning and, cures everything. Stan. Agreed. I'm telling you. <laughs> but you're saying this is a 49ers fan. Y'all were down to y'all's fourth string quarterback in the NFC title game. Went all the way to the NFC title game with your third string quarterback. Can like, we not bring up the NFC title game because I'm still bitter? <laughs> oh, so so you think y'all would have had a better showing down in Phoenix than that team that wears the green is what I'm hearing. No, I'm not going to say that. Jalen Hurts was incredible, and that was one of the best Super Bowls of my lifetime, so I'm not going to say that. But I would have loved to see that NFC championship be a game. I agree. And I agree. When your quarterback can't throw beyond seven yards, it's not going to be a game. So no argument there. I'm a little up. I'm just. I just wish it would have been competitive, and we could have seen, like let the better team really win, right? So I get it. I get it. And and from you saying that, now I got a question for you. The starting quarterback for the San Francisco 49ers in 2023. Don't do this. Should to me. be. Ah. Uh, Okay, should be or now. has to be? Because I think it has he, to be Trey Lance he, at this point. Okay, should be. Should be Brock Purdy. But because. we don't know how he... So this is what stinks, is you have two young guys yeah. who've been thrust into situations and are coming off of injury. Trey Lance, you gave up so much to go up and draft this yeah. kid. He finally like is given the reins, uh-huh. and he gets injured right away. And it stinks. And it stinks that Jimmy Garoppolo was put in the situation that he was. And then he gets injured. And Brock Purdy does this just magical run. And everybody, like, wants to root for this kid, whether you're on the team or off the team. Like, even if you're not a fan of the 49ers, you're like, hell yeah, Brock Purdy, Mr. Irrelevant. This is awesome. And he earned it. And now he doesn't get the same opportunity that he should come training camp because of this UCL. And that's a scary injury for a quarterback. Mm -hmm. And how many times have we seen guys that have an elbow injury that just don't look the same? So should be given the opportunity to be the day one starter is Brock Purdy. Will and needs to be is probably Trey Lance. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. And I think that because you gave up so much draft capital to move up to go get Trey Lance, with everything that went on just a couple of years back, it's like you have to see what you have within him. Yeah. And I think that to me, this is the make or break year for Trey Lance. And it probably shouldn't be coming up this soon, but I feel like the situation that the 49ers are in, they still have that fantastic defense. Obviously, D'Amico Ryan's now the head coach for the Houston Texans, but having everything in place, you still got Debo Samuel. You still got George Kittle. You still got Christian McCaffrey. So you have the nucleus in place. 
So right now, I got to see what I got with Trey Lance. And if I don't have what I think I'm supposed to have within Trey Lance, I got to move off him. And I just got to go to Brock Purdy. I'm assuming that Jimmy G is going to be on a new team coming up very soon. That's what I'm assuming. So that would be my take on it that Brock Purdy, obviously, because he was a low-round draft pick, he was Mr. Irrelevant. And because... They gave up so much to go get Trey Lance, and we know he was, what, the third overall pick in the draft. They have to give him every opportunity to fail before they just automatically go to Mr. Irrelevant. Yeah, and it's, as a fan, nerve-wracking because this window is just getting smaller and smaller for the 49ers to have success. And, like, how many years are we talking about this team saying, well, imagine if they had a quarterback? Well, imagine if they had a quarterback. They haven't really needed one because they have so many offensive weapons who do the work and do the yards after catch and have this incredible ability. And it's a team that Kyle Shanahan has built up from the trenches. So every piece of this team is there except the most critical one. And the thing about Trey Lance that worries me is that we're going on four years now dating back to him being at North Dakota State. Mm -hmm where he has played in that four year span, fewer games than Brock Purdy has. Yep. And like, you really, really don't know what he has. And even coming out of college, you knew there was that boom or bust potential. And we're years in now where we still don't know the answer to that question. And that's scary. Yeah. I think that uh, uh, you hit it right on the head and because where someone is drafted, we all know that plays a huge part <laughs> into the length of a leash that they're given as far as how many mistakes that they're allowed to make, how long the franchise is going to actually go ahead and try to ride with them before they just pull the plug and just go ahead and admit defeat or admit that they made a mistake. You look at the New York Jets. Mike White has played better than uh, than uh, my man, Zach Wilson. Zach Wilson. Yeah. He's played better than him. We all know that. And just like we see with Brock Purdy, who's played better than Trey Lance. But because we took them in the top five, because we gave up a lot of traffic capital to go get them, we have to go ahead and just ride with him. And like you just said, for a fan, it's nerve wracking because the fan is like, hey, listen, that guy right there is producing more. He's making more plays. Leave him out there. And then, you know, the guys in the front office, they're kind of like, oh, well, you know, it's not that simple. We did this. We did that. We took him here. We didn't take that guy until later round. So, yeah, as a fan, it's definitely frustrating when you know the politics that creeps into that. And I feel bad for Trey Lance. Like, it's not his fault that he was drafted where he was and that these expectations come along with that. But that's just the case that we're in. Like, imagine if the 49ers traded Trey Lance and he took off somewhere else, yeah. how much they would just, like, be losing their minds. And so I get why they have to ride it out and see. But it's just add them to the list of franchises with quarterback problems. <laughs> it's crazy. Hey, trust me, you are look at me. Look, look at my team. Like we <laughs> we don't know who our friend, we don't know who our quarterback's gonna be. We don't hey, know if we okay. draft somebody. Give me your true assessment of Derek Carr. Oh, okay. I'll give you my true assessment. I think Derek Carr is by no means a scrub. By no means. He obviously was thrown right at uh right into the Lions Den uh coming out of college when we drafted him second round, I think number 34 overall, or something like that. So he's been starting ever since. He got to the Raiders back in 2014. Obviously, he's had some good seasons, been to Pro Bowls. Uh, his third year in the league, 2016, he, he was actually receiving NFL MVP votes. And I feel like everything was trending upward until he broke his leg against the Indianapolis Colts around Christmas time back in that 2016 season. The Raiders went 12-4, and four, had their best season since they lost the Super Bowl to the Tampa Bay Buccaneers back in the 2002 year. And I feel like after then, that's when Jack Del Rio is no longer the coach. That's when you see John Gruden come in. And it just seemed like him and John Gruden never gelled. And to me, I feel like Derek Carr is a very is a good quarterback. Great. I wouldn't go that far. Elite. I'm not definitely I'm definitely not saying that, but I think that he's definitely, let's say, a top 15 quarterback within the NFL. And for a lot of people within Raider Nation. Just when Derek Carr is playing well enough to where you feel like you can be as confident in him playing well as you are that Sunday comes after Saturday, that's when he'll give you a dud of a game. 
<laughs> and, the, and and so he'll he'll have two or he'll have two good games. And then by just like I said, just when you get to the point to where you feel like you can stamp it, where you can book it like, OK, I know he's going to play well this weekend the same way I know that Wednesday comes after Tuesday. That's when you'll have the dud of a game. I remember a couple of years ago against the Washington Commanders, uh, against the New York Giants. And then we see this past season against the Pittsburgh Steelers. And so that's what probably frustrates Raider Nation the most and probably even Josh McDaniels to a certain degree. And it just seems like there's some times where he just doesn't pull the trigger or seems like he's worried about the pass rush or he'll just have certain games where it just kind of, you just kind of scratch your head. Like, yeah, how did that really happen? So when you ask me my assessment, I think he's a top 15 quarterback. I think he's one of the better quarterbacks in the league. I do not believe that he's on the Mahomes, Allen mm -hmm. Burrow level to where, he can just lead us there, and he doesn't really need anything else. I feel like he needs a good defense, which is something he has not had in well, I don't know how long out there playing for that's Oakland. Where, yeah, that's where my head goes is that, like, I hope that he gets in a good situation here in free agency because, yes, I know that there have been a number of games that were, like, in his hands to be one that he didn't deliver in yeah. but big picture he's had a really tough go like not only in his time with the raiders has have they had a bad defense over that span of time they have had the worst defense in the nfl actually <laughs> oh, come on, and when you're just, giving up, just drive no. the stake in even even, even harder Storm. i'm just saying <laughs> it's hard for an offense to overcome a defense no giving up 26 it. points per game on average no doubt like, about that's, it that's hard he's also had six different head coaches he's had off the field issues with players that you yeah. thought through the draft were going to build up your team in a positive way that unfortunately have have not worked out and it's very sad in a lot of instances especially when it comes to the henry rugg side of things yeah. but he like he has dealt with a lot and he's a guy that's still just a year removed from throwing for 4800 yards so i think there's a lot of potential for Derek Carr, if he's in the right situation, and then maybe if he still fails, then I'll be like, "All right, I'm out." But <laughs> I, I want to see him. I want to see him him given a shot. I really, yeah. really do. I hope he lands somewhere that that has a defense that can hold teams back a little bit, so that he doesn't have to put up 30 points a game to win. Yeah, I think that uh, right now, I believe he's uh, scheduled to go and meet, uh, meet with. I think it's the Panthers. I believe. Uh, he's that already would be interesting. But see, what do you think about Frank Reich going for another veteran quarterback and having it not work out? Like, I don't, it's you know, uh, the last few years haven't gone great. You know, to me, and, and, and this is something that, that one of my good friends and actually Rod Woodson said to us uh, several years ago, back in my years in Oakland, and how he basically said, he's like, guys, he's like, you don't have to be good to throw for 4,000 yards. Like there's plenty of guys throwing for 4,000 yards that aren't even that good. And right now in today's game with the college scheme that's matriculated upwards to the NFL with the RPO, uh, uh, the, the, the read action, the read option, things like that. Because of that, it's easier to put up gaudy numbers for college quarterbacks and even some within the NFL. And so the point what I'm trying to make by all that I think Frank Reich knows that. And I think that because of that, that's why he's okay with possibly looking at a veteran quarterback because we look at all of these college guys coming out, they go top 10 in the draft. Some of them win the Heisman, things like that. And a lot of them don't pan out. And I think that when you look at these high-valued, high-priced, high-drafted college quarterbacks, it's literally a crapshoot. And if they don't go to a team that runs a scheme that is conducive to their skill set, to what they did back in college where they were so prolific, I feel like you, you're just you're setting yourself up for failure. And I think Frank Wright, I think he knows that because he's played quarterback in this league, obviously backing up Jim Kelly, things like that. So to me, I don't I, like even right now with my Raiders, I'm not extremely enthused or excited about who which young quarterback are we going to take in the draft with you know the top 10 pick because at the end of the day usually five will go in the first round and three of them will be kind of like whatever there's another one that'll be kind of good 
kind of, you know, good enough to go ahead and call him a franchise quarterback. And then there will be one stud. There will be one star. There will be one Joe Burrow. There will be a Josh Allen. There will be a Pat Mahomes. But out of the five that are usually drafted in the t- in the first round, three of them are just kind of like what you would consider uh, Zach Wilson. Yeah, and I'm 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 really curious as the combine starts this week who yeah. that guy that's the actual star is going to be because and I'm sorry I'm like squirrel we're just going on so many <laughs> tangents right now but um, like Bryce Young is someone who has all of the like on field makeup of a quarterback except the size that you want mm-hmm. right like he can do the off platform throws he can be mobile he's super accurate when i covered the sugar bowl this year for national radio nick saban and bill o'brien are coming to us telling us that size doesn't matter because bryce young is brilliant he's just a different type of a guy and leader and then you have cj stroud who does have the body and the build. And then you have Anthony Richardson, who everybody thinks could be the next Cam Newton or Uh Josh Allen's going to make this guy a lot of money because he also couldn't hit the broadside of a barn with a football, but look what he's become in the NFL. (laughs) And so, like, you know, I'm just saying, like, it's real. And Will Levis, too. He puts mayonnaise in coffee, though, so I can't get on board with that kid. But... Like truly, I'm curious of those four quarterbacks, or maybe even if you want to throw Hendon Hooker in there, who will probably be a, a little bit later on in the quarterback group. Those guys, who's going to emerge as the star? Who's going to be the real the real guy of this draft class? Because it's not always the guy that goes number one. To your point, definitely not. And and like your guess is good is as good as mine. And you know, as I as I as I watch more and more and become more acquainted with a lot of coaches around the league, whether it's quarterback coach, offensive coordinator, what have you, I start to learn that so much of it is just the system that he has either around him or that it's in place for him with the offensive play caller, with his quarterback coach. Does he have good weapons in place, whether it's a running back, whether it's a left tackle to protect his blind side, whether it's receivers, he can go ahead and get the ball to quickly or to your point, having a good defense that's going to be able to go out there and get stops when this young quarterback has certain games that he may have struggled in like a Brock Purdy for uh certain parts of his uh his illustrious rookie season so i don't know which one's going to turn out to be the goods i don't know which one's going to turn out to be a dud i'm going to make a statement and i'm a and then i'm going to let you respond to it however you want to people ask me about so what do you think about uh josh fields i'm sorry justin fields uh what do you think about cj stroud and for me I'm going to I'm going to make a statement but it's going to be in the form of a question then I'm going to make another statement. When is the I'm last nervous. when is the last time? I'm sorry. Have you ever heard of an Ohio State quarterback that is actually produced at any level higher than mediocre in the NFL? Not off the top of my head. Exactly. That's because it isn't one. So, I just have a problem and maybe I'm just biased, maybe I am. But I just have a problem trusting Ohio State quarterbacks. I just do. Interesting. No, I mean, like I said, I'm trying to rack my brain right now, and I don't have an argument against what you're saying. So (laughs) it's it's just hard. I mean, you watch what he did in the college football playoff this year. Oh yeah, very well when his defense couldn't stop a cold. Right. And he's just throwing all over the place and they should have won the game. It had it not been for the missed field goal. Shank hurt. Oh round man. The world oh, as, yes. as the clock struck midnight. On yeah, New, Year's New Year's Eve. Eve. Yep. <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I don't know. And I, as a college football reporter, didn't do any Ohio state games up close and personal. So I never saw him in person. And that's usually a good indicator for me to evaluate someone better. So I'll be curious to see how he goes through this process and if there are coaches and and staffs that fall in love with him, right? That's a big part that we always see as we watch the combine and these pro days is there's somebody who just, uh, all it takes is one. That's all it takes. He's going to fall in love with this guy and why? I couldn't agree more. Okay. Last two topics. Okay. Stormy. You already mentioned you're very ambitious. Obviously, you're very accomplished with that ambition. And we all know that within this world, 
It's getting a lot better than the way it used to be, but still probably not where it needs to be at. It's what I'm pretty sure you would agree with. So being a woman in such a male testosterone driven industry, talk to me about some of the hurdles that you've had to jump, some of the difficulties for you to reach the plateau that you are being so accomplished. Yeah, well, I appreciate you saying I'm accomplished. I'm working on it. I'm working on it. But there are, it's one of those things where we have made so much progress as women. And I look back at some of the people that I really, really admire who kind of trailblazed and set the platform and foundation for what I get to do and the hurdles that they overcame. And we think that we're so progressive and we've done such a good job of being on a level playing field. And then you see some of the comments that are said to me or to other women on social media or I mean, finding out my email address to send me a note saying I'm the token female at my network and I don't know what I'm talking about and X, Y, Z. And because I never played a game, who am I to be able to cover it? And listen, just because I I worked hard enough and, and did the work and got the opportunity to do the job and you didn't doesn't mean you should come for me. <laughs> like It's just it's it's a weird thing because. I've been so fortunate in my career to work for and with men who have championed me more than other women at times in this industry and that really have seen my potential and seen how much I love sports and how much work and time and effort that I dedicate and put into it and being as nice as humanly possible to everybody along the way, you know, to have those opportunities and to build relationships and connections with the different networks and and leagues and, and players and coaches so that I can do my job better. And it's been hard in a few instances where 20 people could say something nice and complimentary to you. And then there's one jack wagon who's just couldn't care less about Uh a word that's coming out of your mouth, but talking about the way that you look, whether it's good or bad in like very vulgar terms or saying maybe you'd get better assignments if you got a nose job and had a deeper voice. (laughs) And, you know, um, it's, it's hard. Like in college football, for example, my play by play person for this past season was Beth Moens and she is such a well-respected woman in the industry. And she gets some of the most hate of anyone out there and it blows my mind. And so I am so appreciative that there are so many more women that are getting involved in sports that are fans of sports, that there is a place for us here. And I firmly believe that is going to continue to grow and grow. I just wish that, um, that some people would realize that it's our place to be around, you know, and it's frustrating sometimes when people don't. And it's frustrating that I've had a boss one time, and this is probably the only man that ever like that I worked for that wasn't cool and stuff who would tell me that I'm going to go like play reporter for a day. And I'm like, no, I'm not, I'm not playing reporter. I'm going to do my job and mm-hmm. continue to cover a sport that I love and am knowledgeable about. And so Little things have been frustrated. I've been very grateful, like I said, to have worked for some really, really amazing men. And more often than not, things have been positive. But when there have been negatives, it just makes my heart hurt for the people that it really impacts. Like I have a thick skin. Part of being in sports period is having that ability and being able to joke around with the guys. And so I'm I'm good with it. But I know a lot of women that struggle being able to handle it. And I just hope that we continue to make progress in that area. Yeah, uh, you know, well said. And that's something that I firmly believe that we're clearly not where we need to be at as, as a society. Definitely not. I feel like we're we're further along than we once were, but oh, yeah. to your point, absolutely. still a long ways to go. Yeah, absolutely. And that's the thing. Like I'm I'm so lucky for the situation that that I've come into and for the women that have laid the groundwork. But it's like every time I think everything's everything's cool and I love my job and we're doing so good and men and women are the same and we're equal and we're this and we're that, then there's always like somebody that chimes in that's like just awful for no reason. Yeah. You're like, all right, cool. We are back in the Stone Ages after all. <laughs> I definitely get it. All right, Stormy, I'm going to get you out of here. I got one more okay. question for you. All right. I'll so, try not to ramble. <laughs> okay. You've uh, obviously, like I said, VC Network, 
uh, XFL, ESPN sideline reporter, give me the wildest or craziest experience that you've had right now doing what you do. Um, ooh, craziest, wildest. Uh, what it just a, I always say there's a really cool moment that was scary okay. for me was my first ESPN assignment. Period was working an SEC network college basketball game covering Kentucky basketball. Nothing like a tryout game hey. with Hall of Fame coach John Calipari on the sideline, mm-hmm. right? And the week before my game, Maria Taylor was doing a game for Kentucky. And I guess Coach Cal like grabbed her arm in a way that this viral thing happened where it was like, Coach, I'm, I'm not one of your players. You grabbed my arm hard. And it like uh-huh. and they were fine. And it was a it was a fine situation and stuff. Um, they ended up joking about it afterwards, but then I got his game and he, he like my play by play guy said, you should grab his arm. And I was like, no, <laughs> come on. what are you talking about? And then my play by play guy just kept messing with me, kept messing with me. Cause I, I ended up like that week. I went to every practice of Kentucky's that week and Cal was coach Cal was great to me. And we joked around a little bit. Mm-hmm. And so I did it. They were up like 25 at halftime or something. They were against like Troy or a Fort Wayne or some lower level school. Yeah. And so I, I did, I grabbed his arm. <laughs> my idiot oh, self, my first game ever on ESPN. What am I doing? But I grabbed his arm and he like looked at me and I was like, Oh, I'm sorry. Was that too hard coach? <laughs> and he goes, Oh, I'm getting you now. And so I go to ask him my question at halftime. He's like, did you just grab my arm? Did you just grab my arm? And it was hysterical. It is a piece of video that I will save for the rest of my life. But it was mortifying in the moment. But um, yeah, just so that's my favorite slash most interesting, I guess. That's a great one. That's a great one, though. <laughs> John mess. Calipari grabbing his arm. Oh, wow. Yeah. Well, and hey, then that, Tom Hart, who's the play by play guy after that interview goes, was like, Stormy Bon and Tony, first day on the job. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, that's classic. Hey, that's a great one to end on. Stormy, I appreciate you coming on. Much love to you. Much respect. Very happy and very pleased with everything that you're doing. So uh, I just want to say thank you for coming on. Yeah, I really appreciate you having me. Great to get to know you a little bit. And let's keep this relationship going. Oh, absolutely. Will do. I want it on my shoulders, you know what I mean? If 
I'm the the lifeline, which I haven't had to be. You know, my brother was there too. So mm -hmm. if I'm the lifeline. I'm the one that got to take the risk and you know put it on my shoulders. I handle it. It's the same way I play the game. You know, what I mean, I tell coaches all the time, the hard job, put it on me. I'll take it. If I got to go, you know, and do this and and do that, I'll do that. You know, what I mean, that's kind of what it is. That's how I've always been built. Most people, if you really built for it, you want those pressures. You want mm -hmm. that. I mean, it's stressful. It's a lot. But I ain't going to wake up complaining every day. I'm going to go get it done. You know what I mean? Because that's what I seen my mom do growing up. You know, like, seeing my mom going to work every day, come home, help me with my homework, cook, clean, do the same thing over and over again. You know what I mean? I seen my dad do it. You know, go drive a truck all day, get back, ride his horse, come home, throw the football with me, go back, do the same thing. So for me, I never seen them complain about any of that. They just did it. They took it on the head and I kind of, that's what I, that's how I am with my daughter. You know, I can go to work all day. I can be dead tired, but when I get home, I'm going to try to give her as much attention as I can. That's just kind of how I am with my family too. Uh, my mom, my dad, my brothers, my, my fiance, my nephews, they know at the end of the day, you know, I, I, I'm going to go do the work. You know I mean? Just you guys don't mess me over. You guys do what you guys are supposed to do and I'll handle the rest.